people to bicycle. Whether for a trip to the grocery store, a ride along the river, or a pleasant way to get to work or school. In fact, biking has become an important part of the city's identity and quality of life because biking offers a healthy, cost-effective way to get around and combines transportation with physical activity. One of the reasons Cambridge is consistently rated as one of the most bike-friendly cities in America is because the city is committed to planning streets for people. This means balancing the needs of people biking, walking, using transit, and driving to provide safe and comfortable space for everyone. This is supported by the fact that people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds bike in Cambridge, and the number is growing every day. Over 15 years, the city of Cambridge has doubled the amount of bicycle facilities. During that same period, bicycle use has grown nearly four times. A lot goes into making bi Cambridge bike friendly, including off-street paths, dedicated bicycle facilities on streets, the Blue Bikes bike share system, secure places to lock your bike, education programs, and more. However, barriers and challenges still exist. For example, every street is not ideal for biking, and some destinations are hard to reach. Furthermore, there are a variety of barriers that make it harder for people of all ages, abilities, identities, and backgrounds to choose to bicycle. For example, some cannot afford to buy a bike or do not have a secure place to store a bike. Others may have a bike, but are uncomfortable biking at night or on busier streets. Addressing these challenges is why we have the Cambridge Bicycle Plan. The plan sets forth a vision for the future and defined actions the guide decisions around bike facility implementation, programs, policies, and more. The previous plan was developed in 2015. It followed an extensive planning process that included ongoing engagement with the community, including surveys, focus group meetings, street teams, an online map input tool called Wikimap, open house events, and coordination with the bicycle committee. The process also included an extensive technical evaluation of needs and opportunities to expand the bicycle network and bicycle programs. Now, the city is updating the plan using the same general process. The 2020 update includes expanding the plan with a lens on ensuring equitable access for everyone by identifying ways to overcome barriers and provide access. This update further reinforces the city's philosophy that people themselves are at the center of transportation planning and design. The foundation of the Cambridge Bicycle Plan is the vision. In short, the vision is that Cambridge will be a place where bicycling is equally available to everyone. All destinations can be reached by bike. And streets are designed to accommodate bicycling for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. The plan includes goals and targets to move the city toward achieving the vision. The four goals are to get more people biking, be safe for all ages and abilities, utilize best practices, and address barriers to ensure equal access. The plan includes a variety of components designed to work toward achieving the goals and targets. They include the bicycle network vision and facility toolbox, detailed data analysis, and recommendations for a variety of programs and supporting infrastructure. Two programs of note are Cambridge's Safe Routes to School program and ongoing community outreach efforts. Safe Routes to School is a multifaceted program designed to educate children on safe walking and biking skills and to encourage more kids to get to school on foot or by bike. There are programs active at all schools in Cambridge, including elementary, upper schools, and Cambridge Ringe and Latin School, providing both in-classroom and on-the-bike skills training. Community outreach takes multiple forms in Cambridge and focuses on educating people on safe driving and bicycling skills and encouraging more people to ride a bike. These various components of the plan are informed by and advance numerous city plans and policies developed over the last three decades, including the Complete Streets and Vision Zero policies, adopted in 2016, 
and the 2019 Cycling Safety Ordinance. We just wanted to start off with the bike plan video to give you um, an initial idea of some of the initiatives and um, uh, programs that are going on in Cambridge to support biking. Um, we have several guests from the city today uh, to talk about to talk more in depth about the initiatives that are going on in Cambridge. Um, so we're really excited to, um, to have all of the guests today. Um, for anyone that is joining for the first time, um, this is the fourth webinar in a, in a five-part series. Um, uh, my name is Aidy Filson. I am the Mobility Education Coordinator with the City of Cambridge. Um, and we have Mass Bike joining us as a co-host for, for this uh, workshop series. And um, so, Galen, I'll have you introduce yourself. Excellent. I'm glad to see everyone again. I'm Galen Mook, the Executive Director of Mass Bike. Um, we are super excited to be partnering with Cambridge and the Community Development Department to do a lot of bicycling education. And um, for those of you who have been to the prior three clinics, I look forward to expanding on what we've talked about so far. And yeah, thanks, Adi, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am actually going to jump over to our first guest, Brooke, since I think she has a limited uh, schedule today. <laughs> Great. And well, I, I have some slides. Well, I'll go ahead and share those now. But um, nice to, to be here with all of you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about two things today, um, a little bit about the city's Vision Zero efforts, and then also um, kind of an update on some recent changes to the, um, to the cy cycling safety ordinance. Um, so let me just, uh, um, so I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, tell you who I am. So I'm the um, I'm with the city's uh, traffic and park traffic parking and transportation department. I'm the assistant director for street management, which basically means I oversee kind of the um, the operation um, and implementation of design on our streets. And part of my job is um, leading up the city's Vision Zero efforts. Um, so Vision Zero, which um, you guys may or may not be familiar with, is um, a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and serious injuries while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all. It's actually a worldwide movement. It started in Sweden um, in the 90s, and it's unique in um, its approach to traffic safety in that it basically... Uh, the basic premise is that all uh, fatalities and serious injuries are preventable um, in one way or another, um, and that it is possible for us through a combination of um, engineering and behavior changes and really looking at the kind of core causes of um, fatalities and serious injuries, we can design a transportation system that allows that people are human and will make mistakes, but those mistakes won't be fatal or life-changing for people. Um, so this is really, um, it, it's a movement that is happening across the world and has in maybe the past uh, eight or nine years really started to take hold in the US. Um, and the city of Cambridge um, adopted, and this is just a little uh, sprinkling of some of the cities across the US that have adopted Vision Zero. Um, and Cambridge adopted it uh, back in 2016. And the thing that's so powerful about Vision Zero is that it really changes the conversation around crashes and serious injuries um, and around traffic violence from one about blame and kind of pitting one mode against another to really focusing on um, public health and reducing harm. And it kind of moves us away from thinking about cyclists and drivers to just people who are using different modes of transportation. Um, it's a goal that people, it's, it's hard for people to argue against saving lives. So that is really helpful. Um, and in Cambridge, we benefit from the fact that we've been doing this work to make the city safer um, for all road users for quite, um, for quite some time. But Vision Zero was kind of the formalizing and putting a name to, to, to really um, goals and, and um, values that we already held in the city. So as I mentioned, it was adopted unanimously by the council back in 2016. And since then, we've um, had a, a series of steps that we've taken to move us in the right direction. And we still have a ways to go, but it is kind of, it's something that we work very hard to 
um, kind of come really make a, a part of the fabric of everything we do and all of the choices that we make in the city. So it's not just a traffic and parking um, initiative, it's a citywide initiative and we have um, real buy-in from, every, from um, you know, major stakeholders across the city from the city manager's office to the public health department, community development, of course, um, DPW, and really, and then some departments that you might not think of as, as involved in traffic safety, like our um, human resources department or our purchasing department. We all really work together um, on Vision Zero. And some of the things that we've accomplished over the past few years, um, we did lower the default speed limit across the city to 25 miles an hour. We brought that down to 20 in the squares, and now we're in the process of bringing that down to 20 on almost all uh, local streets across the city. Um, we also have some, some significant bike infrastructure projects that we've put in place, both on the capital side and on the quick build side. I'll show you some pictures of those as we move along. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's really given a name to a focus that Cambridge has had for a long time but it's, it's very effective in keeping our eye on making sure that we're thinking about safety in every decision that we make. Uh, the, our kind of, our blueprint for what we're doing is the Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, that came out a few years ago and it is, um, it is basically a list of all of the steps that we're, try that we're taking to get to zero fatalities and serious injuries. And it's designed around a series of um, commitments. Um, we, you know, to reach vi Vision Zero, we'll design and operate safe streets, we'll improve large vehicle, taxi, and TNC safety, we'll ensure equity um, in everything that we do around Vision Zero, we'll lead by example, making sure that city operations, um, you know, safety starts at home, so our city operations have to be as safe as possible, we'll engage the public in the process, um, as well as creating partnerships. And we'll do this in a very data-driven way um, and measure our progress. Um, also in the action plan, in addition to kind of those organizing commitments, um, we also have some cross-cutting themes that we, that we have to keep in mind with everything that we do with Vision Zero. And that includes being data-driven, keeping equity at the forefront of what we do, um, making sure that we're focusing always on mode shift, um, collaboration and kind of the public health perspective of harm reduction. Um, so again, lowering the default speed limit, the 20 mile an hour program. This just, uh, this map just, it's a little blurry and you can't see the details, but it does give you an idea. All of the streets in purple will be going down to 20 miles an hour. So as you can see, it's, it's we like to say it's most Cambridge streets. So. Great. Um, and this, this map just kind of gives you a little insight into how we're using data um, to, to guide our work. Um, here in the, in, the in the black circles, you see kind of clusters of um, bicycle crashes. So uh, this is data from back in 2015 to 2016. So we look at these hotspot maps and we're able to prioritize um, the work that we're doing in um, kind of this long, narrow um, circle. Uh, the Mass Ave hotspots, we did the South Mass Ave Corridor Safety Improvement Project where we installed separated bike lanes from uh, kind of Sydney Street near Central Square down to the river. Um, the very hot spot around Inman Square, um, you know, we're in the midst of a full reconstruction um, that will bring um, sidewalk level separated bike lanes to the entire square. So I, I'm taking a moment to do a little plug here. Um, in addition to our kind of internal working group, um, where city workers, you know, city employees are working on Vision Zero, we also have a Vision Zero advisory group made up of residents and organizations, um, advocacy and other local organizations. Um, and as a group, they meet quarterly and they help us shape the Vision Zero program and also act as Vision Zero ambassadors out in the community. Um, and we will actually be issuing a new call for membership very shortly. So I would really encourage anyone who's interested in that um, to uh, keep an eye out for that or get in touch and let us know and I'll make sure you get that call when, um, when it goes out. Uh, the second thing I wanted to touch on shortly was the bicycle safety ordinance. So um, in 2019, the city, adopt, the city council adopted an ordinance 
uh, the first of its kind in the nation, um, that will require the city to install separated bike lanes anytime we do capital construction on a road that has been designated for separation in the, um, in the Cambridge bike plan. Um, so, you know, it's very powerful because it's not, um, you know, every time, there's so many competing interests um, when we go and we look at how to redesign a street and the, the bike safety ordinance really keeps um, the bike facilities at the forefront in those conversations, which is really powerful. Um, but after that um, ordinance was adopted, um, you know, I think it, capital work is very slow. It takes a lot of time. Um, so there's actually an amendment to that ordinance now, which is focusing more on quick build installations and will require us to install the entire network of uh, separated bike lanes across the city by the spring of 2026. So it's a very ambitious uh, timeline for us. Um, we'll do at least 2.5 miles a year, but in order to meet the full uh, 22.5 miles, we'll need to do more than that. Um, but that's a minimum for each year. It will include all of Mass Ave, um, probably in a variety of different ways because different sections of Mass Ave have different challenges. So some will be able to do as quick build, some um, will have to wait for a capital construction, but we will eventually address all of Mass Ave. Um, and while the, the target is, is 2026, there are some, some opportunities for extensions due to impacts from COVID-19. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very complex ordinance if you look at it. So I just, these are kind of the basics. Um, uh, it's based on the 2015 um, bicycle network, but, but that will evolve as there are new, um, as there are updates to that. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's pretty exciting. And I think it means you'll be seeing a lot more high comfort uh, ways to get around the city very quickly. Um, uh, so, and as I mentioned, some of them will be capital construction. This is a, um, this is a, hopefully an after picture, hopefully, of the changes coming to Inman Square. Um, all of these, uh, you know, all of the green you see here represents the sidewalk level separated bike lanes that will, will take you through the square when construction is done. Um, we're really excited about that, uh, both from a Vision Zero perspective and from, um, you know, in support of the ordinance as well. This, uh, this is some work we just did in Harvard Square, um, which kind of represents the quick build type of work that we're doing, where we are just changing the, the layout of the roadway in paint and posts. And that will be a significant portion of um, the work that we do for the ordinance uh, will be done as quick build, um, just by the nature of, of how much longer and how much more money capital construction takes. Um, this is another one. If you've been down um, on Auburn Street recently, um, just this fall, we implemented separated bike lanes along this corridor as well. And that's about all that I have. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we started off with a, initially a video about the bike plan. Um, I don't know, do we want to hop into some of the slides or Kara, do you want to add anything about the bike plan? Brooke mentioned it a little bit at the end of hers, uh, her presentation as well. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Kara Seiderman. I work with AD in the Community Development Department and I manage the Bicycle and Pedestrian Mobility Program. Although um, when I started out, I was it was just me and now there's a whole team of people who work on it. Um, and I do a lot of different things related to street design. I work with the Bicycle Committee and the Pedestrian Committee. And um, uh, we are now I, um, updating the uh, bicycle plan. So you saw that overview video and we are working on um, enhancing some of the information, particularly around um, access for people of all types and equitable access. And we are making some modifications to the bicycle network. And um, I guess uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the plan. Um, what, you know, what is involved in it. We um i think were we going to show the part of the video about what the network what is involved in the network but i also want to know what people are most interested in i didn't and, and give people an opportunity to ask about it 
as well. Yeah, I have a little three minute video uh, clip from that, that, um, that maybe I'll put on now. And if anyone has questions in the meantime, while I'm showing the video, you can um, use the chat box to ask. Um, and then Kara can ask and or answer any questions on that. Right, right. I just, um, I guess I'll just say that um, as you saw in the introduction, the bicycle plan encompasses um, information about the physical network and also about the programs like the ones that Edie is doing um, and also things like operations and how do we, um, you know, how do we maintain things. Um, there's a lot of questions about, you know, how do we decide, like, so you saw in Brooke's slides, uh, you know, that there were projects that are underway that, that have been implemented and why do those things look the way they do and why do we choose to uh, implement infrastructure like that? So the bicycle network vision is about um, how do we create that kind of vision for the best way to make sure that we have a physical infrastructure that supports everyone. So I think that's what you're going to do a little clip from and then I can answer questions about it. Yeah, exactly. And so we're definitely starting off today with some higher level concepts and sort of the planning process uh, behind um, some of the more physical infrastructure that we'll get into with Galen um, in a little bit. So it's good to start off with some of the, the, yeah, the higher level concepts, I think, to help contextualize. So um, I'm going to show this three minute clip from that video. Um, and perfect. In order to make biking possible and enjoyable for people of all ages and abilities, we need to increase safety, comfort, and separation. The Bicycle Network vision achieves this with three types of bikeways. Off-street paths, which are primarily through parks and open space and along linear corridors such as rail lines and rivers. Separated bicycle facilities, which are primarily along major through streets with higher traffic volumes and speeds. These focus on providing access to shopping, jobs, neighboring communities, and the regional trail network. And lower traffic volume, lower speed streets. These are primarily in residential areas and along less busy through streets. They focus on providing access within and between neighborhoods and to local parks and schools. This is the Bicycle Network vision from 2015. The vision creates an aspirational concept for a complete system, enabling people of all ages and abilities to travel more safely and comfortably throughout the city. It is intended to be used as a guide and reference for long, medium, and short-term infrastructure projects undertaken in the city, including projects that are part of the city's five-year plan for sidewalk and street reconstruction. As part of the 2020 Cambridge Bicycle Plan update, the community was invited to identify priorities for updating the Bicycle Network vision. This included map-based comments on an online map and at in-person events. A series of quantitative analyses were also performed to guide this update. One step was to analyze the comfort and therefore bike friendliness of streets in Cambridge based on motor vehicle traffic, speeds, presence of on-street parking, bus routes and heavy vehicle traffic, and amount of space available. Another step was to identify necessary connections, key destinations, and areas where people want to go on their bikes. In addition, considering how we can provide equal access to bicycling for all people was an important factor in the updating of the Bicycle Network vision. Neighborhood revitalization strategy areas which are designated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, were used to identify priority areas in the city. The result of this input and analysis is the proposed bicycle network vision for the 2020 Cambridge Bicycle Plan update. As mentioned, this vision contains over 100 miles of existing, in-progress, and proposed bikeways. 
These will be implemented over time through the city's five-year plan for sidewalk and street reconstruction, as part of ongoing land development and redevelopment, and through a quick build approach. A separate video has been developed to explain the quick build implementation approach. It can be found on the bike plan website. Can I just add one thing is that, so there is more detailed information about all the, um, the different kinds of facilities and that, you know, it's not, as you know, from living in Cambridge, that not everything looks the same. So I'm happy to answer questions about that or there's more um, information, but I know Amy wanted to um, have an opportunity to have more of a back and forth rather than, you know, go through more technical details. But we, um, the bike plan also, um, you can, the, there's a lot of information in the existing bike plan that's available online. Um, and so maybe Aidy can send out the link um, so that you can look at it and spend more time, um, you know, reading about it if you are interested. Awesome, thank you so much, Kara. Um, I think the idea here is to show you some of the uh, initiatives that are happening with um, planning for bicycles in Cambridge and how um, that's an ongoing plan and, um, you know, we're hoping to continue to improve bicycle facilities so that everyone feels comfortable. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Galen um, to talk about what some of the uh, bicycle infrastructure is in Cambridge and also a little bit about route planning, I think, so. Great, thanks Adi. Can everybody see my screen all right? Yep. Sure can. Excellent. Um, thanks, Karen. Thanks, Brooke, for all the work you're doing from the city as well. Um, I'm grateful to be able to ride through the city of Cambridge and see all of the, uh, the evolution of the great um, work and the infrastructure that's going on. Um, just a quick thing I wanted to address before I lose the thread um, it, regarding the police officer enforcement conversation. It is, um, it's a hard task sometimes um, when you're dealing with personalities out there and sometimes police officers are not um, so inclined to be concerned about um, you know, considerations that they're not charged with. And if, if that police officer was on duty to do construction duty, they're actually not allowed, as I understand it, to even do other types of enforcement. So he might've been very gruff um, and totally uncalled for in his demeanor, but I just wanted to say that there's um, a move with Vision Zero, in my opinion, in Mass Bike's opinion, is to actually almost build the infrastructure so you don't require as much enforcement. And if the infrastructure is made so that people are behaving in a way that is safer for all road users that don't necessitate police officers to ticket people for making a left turn because that left turn doesn't even exist, for instance, or to ticket people for parking in the bike lane, well, you wouldn't even need that if the bike lane was up on a curb level by the sidewalk. So I'm grateful to the city and I know it's been an evolving process that will still take a you know, better part of uh, the next coming decade, but the idea of better infrastructure is, in my opinion, gonna be the goal that removes some of these co current conflicts that we're seeing here in 2020 um, and have seen since, you know, I've been around since 2003. So um, it is an evolution and I'm sorry for hearing those stories about, um, you know, enforcement agencies that aren't necessarily geared towards the public safety mind of cyclists who are out there. Um, but in my opinion, the steps that Cambridge is making to build that off street protected network, which we'll talk about in a minute, hopefully will mitigate some of those conflicts to begin with. Um, that's the goal, at least in my mind. So um, just want to throw that out there from Mass Pike's perspective. And I, I appreciate Kara and Brooke being able to be here from the city to answer questions directly too. Um, just to jump right in, um, we're going to fly through a presentation for the interest of time. And a lot of this stuff, it's going to be recorded. We'll share the slides so you can check it out after. We're also pairing this with the City of Cambridge's Bike Lane Toolkit. So basically what we're going to be talking about today, um, about planning for all types of riders, routing options in the Cambridge bike map, which Brooke touched on. Um, so that'll be the core. And then we'll go a little bit into the crash map, which I've touched on in prior presentations. We'll talk a little bit about bike sharing locations as it comes in with the bike map and uh, types of bike lanes. But because there's such a variety of bike lanes, I'm really not even gonna read all my slides. I'm just gonna fly right through. So bear with me here. Um, and 80, should I wrap up close to 10.30 or what's, what's the timing that I should shoot for here? Yeah, I think uh, 10.30 we'll have another guest joining. Okay. Um, 
So. Very exciting. Um, you are all extra spoiled today because we have a ton of resources here for you. Um, I'm gonna keep my slide up here that I bring to every presentation, which is about the three keys to writing success, comfort, knowledge, and awareness. I'm not gonna belabor the point again, but the goal is comfort. Um, so we're trying to build the comfortable as possible for your type of writing. What we build into these presentations is a lot of the know-how, a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the information that we're gonna share. So that's where the meat of what we talk about is in the knowledge category. And of course, awareness is to remind yourself that you are responsible for how you operate out there. Um, we're gonna give some guide points. We're gonna let you know what infrastructure means from a planning perspective, from a cultural perspective, from an urban design perspective, but everything changes. And a comfortable street will change depending on the day, depending on the weather, depending on your mood, depending on the traffic. So you have to be aware of all of this too. And just like I've said in prior presentations, this is not gospel. This is all a guide point for which you can then take to then impact how you view riding out there, especially if you're new to getting out there or aren't comfortable on certain types of roads. That's totally fine, but you need to be aware of where you're riding and your own comfort level um, and to know that there are options out there so that you can change up your bike, change up your street, change up your ride to make it as safe and comfortable as possible. So in all these presentations, please keep these three key uh, success uh, points in mind, comfort, knowledge, and awareness. Um, I love this slide, um, although it, you know, maybe the low stress tolerance slide versus the high stress tolerance slide might not necessarily be representative of older adults. Um, I also like to think that we build for ages eight to 108 in our main goal. So Mass Bike's role as we go around the state is to try to get us out of the high stress tolerance category for bike infrastructure and really build the purpose of what we're trying to do in the world is build for the lower stress tolerance. So that is safe routes to school so a, a, a child can ride to their elementary school safely. Um, but also an older adult who might not be comfortable riding um, in traffic, might not have the same reaction time, might not have the same physical ability as somebody who might be inclined to ride in traffic. They have uh, choices as to where they can ride and still get to their destinations, be for recreation, be for commuting, be for transportation in general, um, and that there are options out there. So um, keep this slide in mind. And my goal is to kind of, and I think the city of Cambridge, based off their ordinance, their citywide ordinance, is trying to build a world that is for the lower stress tolerance level riders, which arguably uh, it's kind of what these presentations are geared for. If you wanted to come to a presentation about high stress tolerance, we can talk about riding in a Peloton, and uh, going 100 miles on the North Shore in a bike race, riding to Portland in two days straight without stopping. We can talk about that at some point, but today and most of the days that we're gonna be here, it's geared towards the lower stress. Um, one of the key ways of getting to that lower stress is planning your bike route. So we talked about this before with the urban basics, but the idea is get to know your resources. We're building this bike buddy network here, the city of Cambridge, and um, great, great on 80 for being that interconnected tissue um, to make sure that people are pairing up. I think that's the best way for folks to kind of get familiar with riding because you can share tips, you can share tricks. Um, and then, you know, like we were talking about um, in some of the chat questions that came up, if you're not comfortable riding um, on streets, on normal traffic days, that's fine, because sometimes on Sundays, we close Memorial Drive, and you can take a test ride, you can go travel around, depending on the day, depending on the, the road that you're on, um, different stress levels will be on different streets, and um, we'll talk about in a second, based a little bit off what Brooke touched on, that um, the city of Cambridge does a really good job of analyzing their streets to better inform your decision. Um, here's the Cambridge bike map. We've talked about this before. Um, there's a lot to it. Um, I'm not going to leave this slide up for too long because we can send this in a PDF. Um, when we're back in person, this is printed out. This is a wonderful resource, but I really like the purple. The purple is my favorite infrastructure in the city of Cambridge. It's off street, off road pathways. The next step, I would go for the blues, um, preferably the light blues where they're buffered, um, and the reds, which are fully separated bike lanes that are like 
removed by a physical barrier. And we'll talk about the different types in a minute, but this is a guide point. Once you've got some of the knowledge of what these words mean, what these terminology, what the terminology actually refers to, um, then you can actually look at this map and get a good understanding of how things go. But um, today's presentation is to talk about what's the difference between a buffered bike lane and a separated bike lane and a normal bike lane and a contraflow bike lane and all the rest. Um, and again, we're gonna fly through it. So there's gonna be a little bit of research we're gonna ask you to do on your own afterwards. We are here to provide all of the information. Um, this is touching on a little bit of what Brooke was talking about with the comfort level of the city of Cambridge. This is part of the current bike plan. I believe this is updated as of last year, um, which is wonderful to see as a data visualization person. I love to take a look at colors and get a sense of the information behind those colors. So what we're doing here with the city of Cambridge is to say, oh, the greens and the blues are the high comfort level. And we used to phrase this as low stress, but we figured, well, that's kind of like a double negative. We're gonna go with high comfort because that's a double positive. So we're looking at what's the most comfortable because that's the most encouraging to get you out and ride. So take a look at this map for the next 20 seconds while I keep talking. Try to find where you live or where you ride or where your library is um, or where your school might be or where your classes or your work and your shopping and try to find the higher comfort roads that'll get you there. Um, now the thing about the fact of the matter in 2020 is that if you break out just the lower stress roads, it's not the whole city. And this looks like a little bit of a patchy network. Now this is understandable for those of you who have lived in Cambridge um, or ridden in Cambridge for several years, for a decade or 15 years, you'll understand that it is an evolution that's taking place, which takes time. The beauty of the citywide ordinance in the city of Cambridge is that whenever there's a new development, whenever there's a new construction, whenever there's a new utility that gets put in, if it's part of the bike map, it gets built. But in order for that to happen, there has to be an impetus, a development project to kick off that, um, that bike lane. So the bike lane itself may sometimes be a secondary offshoot of the project, which means it's a little bit patchy, but the beauty of the ordinance is that over time, as the city gets redeveloped, they are uh, developers, the city, the um, construction teams, the designers are required to build out a protected network. So this is the lower stress roads, which is a little bit different than the high comfort, but the idea of the lower stress roads mean that some of these also don't have bike infrastructure. These are just the roadways. So different from the bike network, which is the bike lanes and the infrastructure, the beauty of what Cambridge is doing is actually testing out the stress levels and the comfort levels of the roadways. And that's an important distinction that I'll touch on in a minute because not every road has a bike lane, but that doesn't mean that if a road has a bike lane, it is a high comfort. You'll see that in this green, which is the higher comfort ones, this is a comfortable for all ages, you have to kind of fill in some of the gaps. And then if I add in the level one comfort and the level two comfort, you'll start to see that the network really does knit itself together. So if you're going from all the way from East Cambridge, Kendall Square to Fresh Pond, you can actually look at this and say, okay, which ones might be higher comfort? And I'm comfortable on the greens, but not so much on the blues. You're gonna need to find a way to either go around the blues. Again, not gospel, it all changes depending on the time of day the weather, the traffic, et cetera. But just be prepared that not every street is a high comfort street if you're trying to get across the entire city circa 2019. So the beauty of these maps, which is also part of the Cambridge bike plan and the analysis that's going on right now, is that what we're looking at here is how, for you, how to help you think about going from point A to point B to point C to point X to point W um, while using this type of feedback but again, this is just a guide point and you're gonna to need to make your own decisions. But the beauty of what I love about Cambridge is that they make that data all public. Um, along with these uh, bike maps, so you'll, you'll find the high comfort routes um, that are the greens and the blues. If you are choosing to ride the bike share bikes, you should also utilize the bike share bike network to figure out where your ride, your origin and destination will be based off the ride to utilize the higher comfort roadways. 
So here is just a snippet of Blue Bikes. I don't want to get too much into it because we'll actually cover it a little bit later and definitely next week when we talk about different types of bikes and adaptive bikes. But for those of you who are interested in trying out the bike share, you should know that the bike share map is just about stations which have the level of bikes that are available or the ability to have a space to drop the bike. I know it's kind of confusing right now. We'll get into it in a little bit. But just keep in mind what I want to share here is the map of the bike share. If you're using bike share, can also be overlaid with the higher comfort, lower stress routes. Um, I'll take a quick break. Katie, hey, looks like you want to jump in. Um, yes. Is this uh, should we have Jen jump here with jump in with information about Blue Bikes memberships, or is that coming later? Ooh. Um, it could come later. Let me fly through, unless Jen's on a timeline. Actually, you know what? I'll take a step back. Jen, please feel free to jump on in if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry, I realize it looks like I'm not looking at you, but it's because the screen is this way. So <laughs> apologies. Um, so hi, everybody. It's so nice to see familiar faces. I'm glad you're all here. Um, I just wanted to jump in quickly with a few of the membership options. Blue Bike is our publicly owned bike share program and Kara, AD, and I work on that program with the other municipalities that own the system. Um, I wonder, maybe I'll just look here and not look at my screen. And um, there are so many ways that you could try out Blue Bikes um, in a really affordable way. Um, Blue Bikes is only $99 a year if you buy a one-year membership. It's unlimited trips. You can use it as many times a day as you have trips, which is a really nice option. Um, we also have a lot of membership plans. For those of you who work for companies that are corporate members, you very well could get either free or discounted memberships through work. Um, so check with your payroll uh, department and they'll be able to tell you. We have an income eligible program, which is also a drastic discount. Um, so that's a really good option. We also have often free ride days. And in fact, today is a free ride day for election day. So I know it's a little bit chilly, but if you wanna try them out today, you can try them for free. Um, in order to be able to do that today, you do need to download the app on a smartphone. So that's one barrier, but if you have a smartphone, it's free and you can try them out today. Um, it's again, unlimited rides for 24 hours, which is pretty awesome. Um, um, and then we have lots of other options. An easy way to get in touch with me is to email me at transportation at cambridgema.gov and I can get you any of the information you need. Um, one last one is if you work for any small businesses in Cambridge, Boston, Somerville, Brookline, um, we do have free three month memberships right now due to COVID. So um, that's again, just email me at transportation at cambridgema.gov and I can get you all that information. Well, cool. and I'll send Jen's contact information for the Blue Bikes program in, a, in the follow-up email as well. Cool, thank you, Jen. Awesome, thanks, Jen. And thanks to City of Cambridge for getting the Blue Bikes to be such a strong program too. Um, what you'll notice about this map is there are big clusters, uh, specifically around origins and destinations. Um, if it's a block or two to walk to a station from where you're trying to get to or where you're starting from, that's okay. But the idea is that it's a great way to start riding um, and not needing your own bike. So all that talk about maintenance, all that talk about locking up and all the things that we did in the urban cycling basics, you know, that, that kind of gets out of the equation with the blue bikes. It's a quick and easy way just to try out riding. Um, and on a day like today, it's chilly, but it's sunny and it's free. So, cool. Thanks. Um, now, Brooke brought this up, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but what I really want to um, emphasize is my graciousness to the city of Cambridge for providing this data. I work in all 351 municipalities in the Commonwealth, and it is like pulling teeth to get crash data or safety information about roadways on a municipal level. And the uh, city of Cambridge actually makes this very easy for advocates so we can focus our efforts as to where the higher crashes are. So you'll see a big cluster around Inman, big cluster around Harvard, a particularly big cluster around um, what's happening around MIT and Mass Ave. So there's a lot of interest in fixing those corridors based off of bicycle crashes. And that means my job becomes a lot easier because I have data to use and Cambridge's job becomes a lot easier because ideally we're preventing crashes and making the world safer for everybody. Um, 
I also want to point out that not just for the city's point of view, but from your own personal point of view, you can use the city of Cambridge data, if you're a data person, to actually analyze where the safer roads are based off arguably the negative aspects of crashing. Now, I do want to reemphasize that I prefer to, to think about street safety as these are higher comfort as opposed to less danger. But for this slide, we'll talk a little bit about the dangers. Now, this is a crash map. Actually, it's older. This is from 2010 to 2013. So this is outdated, but this is an example of where I've been able to use advocacy to show where crashes have occurred from bicycle crashes and to kind of get an idea of where I would choose to ride. So not to spend too much time on the negative here, but I want you to think about Broadway, which kind of cuts across the middle of the screen, and Mass Ave, which kind of cuts across the bottom of the screen, are high crash areas. And the reason is there's a lot of truck traffic, bus tra uh, traffic, pedestrian traffic, um, Ubers, parking and bike lanes, people hopping in and out of cars, a lot more bicyclists, so per capita, there's just more riders. But if you look at the road that splits the middle of arguably the higher crash Broadway and the higher crash Mass Ave, you have Harvard Street. And Harvard Street is that quieter road, does not have a bike lane. You are riding in traffic, but traffic is slower. It's not a business district. So if you really wanted to, you could also ride on the sidewalk. And the idea of having fewer crashes means it's actually kind of a safer road. Still gets you to point A to point B, generally the same way that Broadway and Mass Ave would, if that's along your corridor. But this is an example of how I utilize data to say, oh, I'm actually gonna choose the safer route. And to some of you that might be intuitive, you might already know that, but some of you might wanna to go to the cambridgema.gov site and actually check it out. Um, and we'll send these links to, so you can actually look at all the data. But the beauty of Cambridge is that each one of these, if this was a live um, uh, URL, I could hover over each dot and it would tell me the time of day, the reason for the crash, the severity of the crash. Most of these are just a bicyclist slipping on leaves or you know, getting into a crash on their own, not involving a motor vehicle. But um, you know, besides the point, the more crashes tend to show me that like, oh, maybe I'll avoid that street if I'm able to and take a quieter street. So kind of combining the idea of the general um, crash frequency with the very specific crash frequency helps inform how I think about my bike lane network. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep on flying. So one of the cool things that's happening currently, which is actually a, a symptom of the pandemic, um, not necessarily a great thing. Um, oh, Kara, did you wanna jump in? I'm sorry. Um, it's like I, can, I was just gonna say something about the crash data, which is the point that you were making in terms of it's, it, it, some of it is reflective. I just wanna be mindful of the fact of how many people are actually using a road. So there's something called the crash rate. So sometimes you might see something with more crashes, but just because there's more people. So for example, you may not see that many crashes on Memorial Drive, um, but that doesn't mean that it's safe to, <laughs> to ride on Memorial Drive itself. So um, we do have other information about what the, like Hampshire Street has got a lot of blue dots, but it's actually a low crash rate um, because there's so many people who are, who are riding. Um, so it's a little bit uh, more complicated, but I think your point about Harvard Street is also a great one that it's um, it's got lower speeds, but also has few, few, just less traffic. So it is a very comfortable environment, even though it doesn't have like a separated facility. Um, and as you start ex experimenting with place in you know, a streets yourself, you'll get some kind of sense of the streets like that, like Harvard Street, which was super comfortable um, and also relatively safe. Okay, that was all. all I right. No, thanks, Kay. I really appreciate that. And it's a good reiteration. These are just um, data points and frequencies, crash numbers, safer streets. It's all relative. Um, so again, I'm throwing a lot of information out there to help you make your own decisions as to where to ride. But uh, just know that there are resources out there if you want to do some research. And thank you, Kara, for clarifying that the difference between rates and um, straight up numbers of crashes really depends on a lot on the numbers of people out there, for sure. Um, the idea of how we are rethinking our urban space provides a wonderful opportunity for us to reclaim what otherwise would have been utilized for high traffic areas and bring those, um, the infrastructure back to a person-based um, system. So the, the interesting thing of what's happening in Cambridge is basically along this phase of the evolution of shared streets, 
Um, we're in kind of like a phase three slow streets and neighborways conversation in the city of Cambridge right now to find corridors, um, and I'll put this up here, um, of where shared streets are taking place. We can talk a little bit about this. I know there was a question, so I actually might find opportunities. I don't know, AD, if now is a good time to, to mention, um, but there is an ongoing conversation about shared streets happening in the city of Cambridge, and we'll link this in the chat where you can actually add your own input. But the idea of there is the idea of basically saying this street is not for throughway anymore. It's just mainly for local traffic. And it, there are cones and barricades up that, you know, drivers can still get around, but they have to go slowly. And we're talking five, 10 miles an hour slowly to make the streets safer for people who need to have physical distancing for biking in the streets for walking on the sidewalks so that there can be more space between people. It's, uh, what I mean to say with here, it's an evolution because this is something that has not been planned due to COVID. This is a response to something that we had just been, um, you know, basically an emergency response for the most part. But what we are seeing is that the city of Cambridge is actively engaging and finding shared streets in all the neighborhoods and they're actively seeking public input as well. So um, I'll actually provide a little bit of space here. I don't know if anybody from the city wants to chime in a little bit about what's going on in the shared streets conversation. Awesome. We also have uh, Suzanne who's joining us also from the city. Um, Suzanne, I don't know if you wanna jump in and talk about shared streets at all. Um, uh, and I think Suzanne is also gonna talk a little bit about what um, we, uh, do in the environmental and transportation planning department. Uh, so, uh, Suzanne, I think Brooke covered a bit about Vision Zero and the safe cycling ordinance, and Kara talked about bike lanes. Um, so, if you want to um, jump in and just, I don't know, if you want to give a, an update on shared streets and talk about uh, uh, our department. So, um, we'll just Persevere. Hi everyone, um, my name is Suzanne Rasmussen. I'm the director of the uh, Environmental and Transportation Planning Division, which is a division in the Community Development Department. And uh, as I was thinking about this presentation, um, uh, I was thinking back to our creation, which was in the middle of the 1990s, and Karen and I were both there, so we are uh, been around for a long time, but our, our, the reason why transportation planning uh, is situated in the community development department was because of a sort of minor revolution that was happening at the time when there was a strong interest in, in walking and biking and sustainable mobility in general, which wasn't happening in the traditional way of the city was thinking about transportation. So this entity was created that became a division of the community development department to focus very strongly on uh, sustainable mobility and guided by a piece of legislation that the city council adopted in the early 1990s called the vehicle trip reduction ordinance. So our focus and mission since um, how long is that? Almost 30 years has been on, on uh, promoting sustainable mobility, um, including walking, biking, taking transit, uh, et cetera. So um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what we do and then we can switch over to the shared streets and um, I'll just make sure I keep an eye on time. Um, so we, we do work in a lot of different areas. Um, and I'll start with what you're doing right now, which is uh, outreach, education, and engaging um, residents and, and, and employees, people who work in Cambridge and visitors to um, uh, use sustainable modes of transportation. So a lot of work is happening uh, uh, to educate people and I, I'm sure you've heard about as part of the series that um, we start very early in the schools, AD and, and Galen is involved in others in, in educating uh, children as young as second grade and continuing all that way through um, yourselves. So always being out there offering people 
information, uh, tips, access to try out different modes, and encouragement to be able to uh, not just uh, take your car out if you have one, uh, but try all these other modes. And I heard, I caught the tail end of Jen talking about uh, how to use blue bikes, et cetera. So we, we have traditionally, and of course through COVID, and um, now we're all in an online world, but traditionally we're very much out in the community a lot to talk to people, um, uh, both about how to use the different modes and also encouraging um, that it makes sense for health reasons, environmental reasons, uh, you learn better in school, etc. So it's a very big area of focus for us. Um, we are also very focused in in the regulatory environment. It's a very different kind of work that we do, but um, many in our group are engaged in reviewing development projects to make sure that um, bike pedestrian and transit mobility is as strong as it can be. And, and once uh, large projects that, that do create uh, significant new trips and parking spaces have been approved, we monitor those projects uh, through their life. So we have, um, uh, many people don't know this, but the city oversees um, transportation to uh, commercial development projects with uh, tens of thousands of employees and also students. So uh, every year we, we know um, how people are traveling, but also enforce that businesses and universities are offering people incentives to use sustainable modes and disincentives to drive their car to work. So it's a, it's a very big part of, of our effort. And of course, uh, uh, projects um, is also something that we're engaged in and they, they range from uh, things like uh, creating pathways. So um, you may or may not know that an example of that is we <clears throat> have been working for many years and are now actually in the design phase of creating a, a multi-use path that will run all the way from the BU Bridge um, up to the, the Cambridge-Somerville line on the other side of Cambridge Street. And so these kinds of off-road paths is, is part of our work and over the years we've done a number of them. Uh, one is under construction out near the water treatment plant that goes to the uh, through Watertown over to the river. And there, there are a number of other examples. But also our group um, often runs the community engagement process for some of the very large projects in the city. So uh, for example, Western Avenue, which has um, the, the uh, probably top ranked um, off um, separated bicycle, bicycle facility in, in the city. We're right now engaged uh, on creating as a, not, not a, probably as luxurious, but also a, a separated bike facility on the River Street project, which our group um, uh, manages both the community engagement process and the design process for, for that project. So um, many large projects um, that we are um, directly uh, managing and a lot of projects that we work uh, collaboratively with the traffic department and the public works department on. And I think this is probably one of the key things to know about transportation work in Cambridge is that it is the collective um, product of the community development department, the, the traffic and parking transportation department and the public works department. And not a day goes by where we're not uh, collaborating on project implementation. As for example, uh, the Vision Zero projects in the, the um, sa cycling safety ordinance and all the projects that uh, we'll be engaged in as a result of that. <clears throat> and as you can sort of roughly think of it as um, where we do a lot of the front end planning and engagement process. Traffic department is responsible for all the operations of all the streets in, in um, whatever that implies. And the public works department is responsible for construction and 
maintenance down the road. So it is a it is a continuum, and and like I said, we're we're all engaged in a lot of the projects, working collaboratively. Um, <clears throat> another aspect of what we do has to do with the the uh, greenhouse gas implications of transportation. So we're very actively engaged in helping to facilitate the transition for people who do own cars and need to own cars to um, electric vehicle technology. And that's challenging in Cambridge because of the number of people who don't have access to off-street parking, but um, are, are reliant on being able to walk, to park on city streets. So we see um, the city having a role in equipping our municipal parking facilities in uh, coming soon and also piloting doing EV charging stations uh, on the street that people who don't have off street parking can access. Um, and I guess I would just uh, round off with um, talking about the future and we uh, are uh, focused on thinking about uh, future of mobility options and and how we create create an equitable um, transportation network for the future. So there are uh, in in the planning stages and um, efforts on the way to think about how and if could new mobility options like electric scooters be integrated and um, how do we handle the <clears throat> possibility of um, autonomous vehicles showing up? What do we do about the, the now expanding use of drone technology? So we're, we're engaged in efforts to think about not what is here today, but how do we shape the, the transportation networks and our regulations to um, ensure that future mobility options serve our needs around mobility and sustainability. Um, so that's just sort of a very high level overview. I'm sure I forgot something because there is a, it, it's, a, it's a wide scope of work and a lot of different things that we're all engaged in. Um, but just a, a quick word on the shared streets. <clears throat> so I'd say the shared streets um, project was primarily spearheaded by the traffic parking and, and transportation department, but um, I'll, I'll um, give the overview from my perspective or from the information that I have available, which is that the initially the city was, uh, many people in the city, including city councilors, were very interested in creating spaces during COVID where people could safely walk and bike um, and um, not be uh, uh, endangered by traffic during COVID and all at the same time uh, practice social distancing. And there was a decision made uh, <clears throat> to try out three st streets initially. Um, you probably know Magazine Street, Harvard Street, and Garden Street. And, and those three streets are, are functioning very differently uh, or were prior to the installation of, of or de declaration of them as shared streets. And all the materials that were used were temporary, so A-frame signs and things like that. And, and the traffic regulation, or it isn't a regulation, the, the uh, decision to make it a 10 mile an hour street was advisory because the city doesn't actually have the <clears throat> ability to, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> set speed limits that is something that is done by the state. So um, these three streets were um, inaugurated as, as uh, temporary experiments, if you will, and there, there was a, a significant and um, different experience on the three streets. Harvest Street by far functioned the best, both in terms of <clears throat> how the street was used and the the level of compliance, if you will, by motorists. Magazine Street was in between and Garden Street was much more challenging because it is more of a through street and, and there was a significant issue around motorists continuing to use the street and, and 
actually sort of vigilante like moving of signs or moving them down or mm -hmm. so there was there was a more challenging uh, street there was then an effort to um, expand the, the pilot and I should have said up front that this was all along um, defined as a pilot as a as a something we, the city would try and see how it worked and um, the and there was a community process undertaken by the uh, traffic department to to get people's feedback on the proposed expansion the decision based on that on the feedback was to not expand the pilot because of the level of uh, concern um, uh, expressed by a significant number of people that participated in the process. So the three streets are still in place and they will not be in place for uh, a lot longer because winter is coming and um, there isn't an exact date yet but at some point uh, probably in the not too distant future, the, the signs will be removed and the streets will revert to their prior use. Um, there is in, uh, interest among a, a group of councillors at least to see an, a revival once the winter is over of the shared street concept. And so that's something that is on the table, but there aren't any concrete plans right now for how, if or how it might be revived in the spring. So I think that's the quick overview. So I'll stop there. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions about anything I said or anything you want to know that I didn't say. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much, Suzanne. Many older uh, slash beginner riders I know hesitate to ride in Cambridge bike lanes, especially those that see heavy commuter use. Uh, for example, Hampshire and Mass Ave, because they hold up uh, much faster bike commuters. What do those commuters feel? What should happen when one or more commuters are delayed by older or newer riders? Should faster riders go into the street if the bike lane is too narrow for passing? Many older slash newer riders stop or hesitantly go into the street to avoid delaying others, neither of which seems great. Mm. Good question. Um, thanks, Adi, for that prompt. I would argue that if you're a faster cyclist, you would be more inclined to pass um, on the left, just like a motorist would pass on the left, and maybe even be more inclined to ride in the streets. Um, I also am a believer that though the current network in most of Massachusetts requires people to be really road weary, to be really um, road ready, to be riding, which might make them more aggressive just by nature of riding in traffic. Um, the off-road pathways and the protected lanes that are up on sidewalks are bringing out slower riders who are uh, more hesitant out there, which I think is a good thing. I actually see slowing down is not necessarily a negative thing. And as a cyclist who is pretty confident, I can tell you I personally have no problem if there are more cyclists ahead of me that require me to either go slower or to navigate out into the roadway to kind of pass. Um, there is no requirement that forces a cyclist to be in a particular bike lane. And I would say that that's something I want to remind all drivers out there as well. But if a cyclist needs to go faster, they're more than welcome to ride in the travel lane with traffic while they're passing in order to get back into a clear bike lane. I think if you are starting out, or even if you just want to ride slower, even if you are experienced, sometimes I ride really slow and I ride like a big cruiser bike that only has one gear and big balloon tires. I'm gonna go slowly. Um, that's fine. I think that's totally fine to go as slow as you need to go for being safe. Um, I think the biggest danger is when people feel intimidated or when they feel like they need to push themselves beyond their own boundaries and beyond their own comfort levels. So I would highly recommend that you just kind of stick to whatever is your comfort level and though it may feel intimidating to you. Um, I know this is going to be hard because it's kind of a personal scenario, but I would say that, you know, if folks are needing to slow down behind you, that's, that's totally fine as well. Um, you might get aggressive people in all parts of your life. You know, the person in line behind you at Starbucks might be itching to get up a little closer and try to cut the line or the driver behind you in traffic. 
might be a little impatient. There are impatient people in the world. and I recognize and understand that. But I would say that this is almost like a very Zen awareness type of thing. If you're riding in a bike lane and you feel like you're doing what is safest for you, keep that MO and don't feel like you need to be intimidated or pushed out of that safety comfort zone. Happy to open it up to any other answers though of other folks who have other interpretations to add. I just want to jump in and say, um, in terms of uh, just urban cycling in general, I think one of the keys and something uh, whenever I do urban cycling basics presentations that I like to reinforce is that I think um, being comfortable taking up space um, is really important uh, as someone that's uh, cycling in an urban setting because there are a lot of street pressures from other cyclists, from, from cars, from drivers. Um, so being comfortable allowing yourself to go slower and if someone wants to go faster, um, you don't have to take on that, uh, you know, their impatience. And in fact, um, if it's not safe for you to move over, you absolutely should not. You definitely shouldn't put yourself out in, in traffic. Um, to make way for a faster rider, it's their responsibility to go out and around and uh, pass you. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why we hold uh, these sort of webinars and workshops is to provide people education about biking in cities. And I think a lot of people, and why we're starting off with the younger generations is to provide education to um, you know, starting from a young age about bicycling. I think most of us um, didn't grow up learning anything other than the skill of how to ride a bike. Um, and so um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily have access to the information or have vaguely learned about it, but not in a structured setting in a way that they're able to um, realize that what they're doing might not be uh, safe especially for other cyclists or for drivers or for whoever else on the street. So that's a reason why we do hold these webinars and um, are hoping to expand the outreach um, of our education program. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so um, I know we're running a, a bit over here. We did have one question about, um, uh, Larry, where'd it go? Um, using public transportation that will carry your bike. Um, so I think we may have touched on, upon this in our urban cycling basics presentation last week, but um, Galen, do you wanna give a, um, a quick summary on that? Yeah, I think it's, there is some learning curve to get over if you've never brought your bike on a bus or on a train. Um, I don't have the slide up here, but if you went to mbta.com slash bikes, or maybe it's bikes on the T, but in any event, it's there. There's a, um, a detail on the MBTA's website on how to use the bike racks on buses and how to incorporate bikes on your um, commuter rail trip and your subway trip on the T. Um, a couple things to keep in mind is that all buses um, that do not go into tunnels or do not use the cable wires for electrical movement, um, they all have bike racks. 100% of the MBTA buses have bike racks unless they go into a tunnel. So the Silver Line 1 and Silver Line 2, for instance, you can't take your bike. Um, and if they have the overhead wires, because it's just the way that the system works, um, but there is a little bit of a learning barrier if um, you're unfamiliar with basically you have to kind of manipulate the rack, pull it down, pull your bike on it, and then put a bar over it to secure it. If you're not comfortable lifting your bike, you may um, need to get assistance. I can't guarantee that the bus driver will provide any actual assistance. They're actually policy, um, their policy is to not actually come out of the bus and assist you, unfortunately. So that is a limitation. If you aren't comfortable lifting your bike onto the rack, you may need to find somebody to help you out, which happens to me sometimes too. My bikes can be heavy. Um, but there's a video on the MBTS website to detail how the bike racks work. There's no time limitation. If the bike has a space, if the bus has a space for a bike, you can take it. On the subway lines, on the T lines, 
you are not allowed to bring your bike on any of the green line trolleys because of the way that they're built. Um, and you're not allowed to build, bring your bike on the commuter hours, during the commuter hours. So not between seven and 10 in the morning and not between four and seven in the evening. Now it's a little bit limited uh, for the blue line that uh, restriction actually is limited to only two hours in each um, morning and evening, but still keep an eye to the commuter time. If you want to take the subway tea during the commuter hours, you're going to have to wait until after um, 10 o'clock in the morning or after 7 p.m. in the evening. Um, the commuter rail is a little bit different. So it used to be the same limitations for the commuter hours if you were going in the peak direction. That means coming into the city in the morning and leaving the city in the evening. However, due to low ridership and some advocacy, which we were part of at MassBike, the commuter rail is now allowing all bikes on all trains at all times. To confirm this though, you should check the commuter rail schedule. And at the top of every schedule, it'll have a little bike symbol for that train, for that schedule. If it's got the bike symbol, you can take your bike no problem. The beauty of the commuter rail is because they're opening up all cars on all trains for physical distancing. Um, that allows, uh, affords us more space to be able to bring bicycles on. However, I will remind you that not every commuter rail station is handicap accessible. So if you're going to get on or off at a station of your choice, you need to make sure that there is an elevator so that you can actually get your bike up and over to get to the street. So for instance, if you're going to Natick, Natick Center does not have an elevator. Don't get out at Natick Center unless you're comfortable carrying your bike up some arguably kind of rickety stairs, not the best. However, West Natick, one more stop down, four miles down the road, does have level platform getting on and off. So that's a nuance to the commuter rail. And that's just because the commuter rail system has been built in bits and pieces over the course of 50 years. Modern stations are all modern. Um, the downtown Salem's, the Yawkey centers, the Porter squares, they all have operational elevators for the most part. You should do some checking because sometimes the elevators are out of service, unfortunately, but the, the station website at mbta.com will give you all that information. But the, also the cool thing about the commuter rail is that it allows you to get out of the urban core to go explore some really awesome, beautiful riding in Massachusetts, specifically around bike paths um, and kind of our regional bike path network, which is beyond Cambridge. Cambridge has some great riding, but if you wanna go out to say, mm, let's pick a spot, um, Lowell, you're a couple miles from the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, which you can ride 14 miles all the way to Concord and then get on the Concord train and come back in. So you can go out to Lowell, take a bike path almost all the way to Concord, hop on the Concord train and come back in. It's a great way to explore. And for those of you who are budget conscious like I am, there's a weekend pass at the commuter rail that it's $10 to do a round trip on the weekends. So that's a really cool way to go explore Massachusetts and check out some of the um, pathway network. If you go to Mass Bike's website, massbike.org, and I'll share this link afterwards as well, we partner um, and share the MAPC, which is the Metro Area Planning Council. You don't need to know that. But anyway, we have a statewide map that tells you where all the off-road bike path networks are and where all the on-road lanes are throughout the entire state of Massachusetts. So you can pick and choose where to check out, which is actually a really cool way to go explore what else is out there beyond Cambridge. Once you feel like you've covered all the bike that you wanna explore in Cambridge, you wanna get out of it. But um, I'm a big multimodal commuter because I also, um, I tend not to use a car the most I can, but I still like to explore Massachusetts. And it's part of my job to go explore Massachusetts. So I do a lot of bus and bike and train and bike. And it's a great way to kind of feel self-sufficient, to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, um, and to basically, you know, get out a little bit of what you're used to. And um, for those of you who have never ridden like the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail or the Northern Strand up in Lynn, or um, you can go to Providence on the commuter rail and take the East Bay bike path. There's some really lovely riding that's out there, um, but you know, you can get there via the train and the bus. So I hope that helped, Amy. Oh, I should also say, um, when the ferries are running in Boston Harbor, you can take your bike on the ferries and you can take your bike to the Harbor Islands or out to Hull or Salem. And you can go ride around there as well. It's free to take your bike on the ferry, free to take your bike on the commuter rail. It's a really cool way to um, really go and explore. 
And just another thing to add quickly to that, um, if you don't feel comfortable bringing your bike on public transportation, using blue bikes in combination with public transportation is a really awesome way of getting to, as a, as a workaround around like needing to lift your bike onto a bus or um, any concerns around uh, the fact that you know, the bike racks will be full or uh, commuter hours. So um, I, I think we've noted in the past that blue bikes are a little bit heavier and more cumbersome. Um, so you may need to in advance sort of work up to being able to, um, to use those and um, you know trying them out ahead of time and getting a sense for what their weight is um, but they are really awesome to use in combination with public transit so um, so I know we're uh, way over today um, I am going to send uh, my usual follow-up email with all of our resources and this presentation um, this Galen slides also go farther into depth on um, the different types of bike lanes and off street bike lanes. Um, one more thing I just want to reiterate is that you are not required to ride in uh, in the bike lanes. Um, oftentimes, if there's debris uh, or something or, you know, sometimes there are um, cars that are parked in the bike lanes. Um, uh, bike lanes can sometimes be a little more dangerous. Um, so um, you know, don't feel like you ever have to stay in the bike lanes, although for the most part, they probably will be where you feel the most comfortable. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I just wanna leave this one slide up for a second. Um, this is part of the MAPC trail map, which is on Mass Bikes website. And this is a great way to get a sense of where the pathway network is in Cambridge and Boston and beyond. We focused a lot on Cambridge today, but you know, biking does not end at the city line. So keep in mind that the regionality of where you're going um, really plays into it. And one thing I want to point out is a little bit of that fresh pond loop in West Cambridge is a short hop to the Minuteman Trail, which will take you all the way to Bedford and beyond. So think um, a little bit beyond your boundaries, but utilize the same concept of where is it feel safest to ride, where is the lowest stress and the highest comfort. So everything we talked about today in terms of the city streets in Cambridge, can also apply to the entirety of the state and the region. However, Cambridge does the best job, in my opinion, of color coding it so it's easy to digest and showing you um, kind of what the status and proposals are of what's coming down the line. And um, I'll send this whole presentation out. Things we didn't cover included um, going through, I'm just gonna like literally just fly through these real quick, the different types of bike lanes, different types of bike boxes, each one has a little bit of a description on it. So we'll talk, um, you know, if there's any questions, we can talk next week about some of these questions. So I just wanna just let you know that there will be more information that we didn't cover on today's slides. That'll be coming at you via the follow-up via 80. And with that, thank you so much. Awesome. And Kara, did you have a, is your, is that a raised hand thumbs up? Uh, no, I was thumb giving you a thumbs up about the blue bikes um, and um, the connections. And I would just say, I know you said that they're heavy, but they're actually, I think most people find them easier to ride um, because they're so stable. They're easy to step through. You can adjust the seat and a, and a piece of, I know you're going to talk about it, but, um, and they have a great safety record. Like the, there's millions, maybe billions of trips on, on bike share and a very, very good safety record. They actually turn out to be um, safer um, in terms of the statistics. So don't. So I'm hoping that the people uh, you know might try them out and um, be able to use them. And they are a great way to to uh, make that combination of um, transit and biking. I think that was a really good point. Great. Well, thank you, Kara. It looks like we. Um, uh, still have Karen and Jen with us, so thank you both for, for joining us today. Um, and yeah, I know today's uh, webinar is a bit higher level in terms of coming from a city perspective. We really wanted to um, show you some of the initiatives that are going on um, in the city and how the city views um, designing for people, and um, especially in terms of making uh, cycling safer overall.
um, both from an infrastructure side, from a education side, and just sort of, you know, all of the departments that um, uh, work together in, in terms of making, um, you know, hopefully a, a safer cycling environment and one that you all will at some point feel comfortable uh, riding in. So um, thank you all for joining us. I know today is a little bit different in terms of uh, our material. Um, and yes, I'll follow up with an email. Thank you, Galen, um, once again for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all at next week's webinar. <laughs>